Volume One, Chapter Eleven of Diana Tempest by Mary Chumley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter Eleven. Still as of old, man by himself is priced. For thirty pieces, Judas sold himself, not Christ. H. C. C. Lent gave way to Easter, and Easter melted into the season, and Mrs. Courtney gave a little dinner party at which John was one of the guests, and Madeline was presented on her marriage, and Di had two new gowns and renovated an old one, and nearly broke Lord Hemsworth's heart by refusing the box-seat on his drag at the meeting of the four in hand. And Lord Hemsworth did not invest in the bay mare with the white stocking, but turned heaven and earth to find another with black points, and succeeded, only to drive in lonely bitterness to the meet. And John was to have been there also, but he had been so severely injured in a fire which broke out at his lodgings, in the room below his, three weeks before, that he was still lying helpless at the house in Park Lane, which he had lent to his aunt, Miss Fane, and whither he was at once taken, after the accident, to struggle slowly back to life and painful convalescence. For the last three weeks, since the fire, hardly any one had seen Colonel Tempest. The old horror had laid hold upon him like a mortal sickness. Sleep had left him. Remorse looked at him out of the eyes of the passers in the street. There was no refuge. He avoided his club. What might he not hear there? What might not have happened in the night? He could trust himself to go nowhere for fear of his face betraying him. He wandered aimlessly out in the evenings in the lonelier portions of the park. Sometimes he would stop his loitering to follow with momentary interest the children sailing their boats on the round pond and then look up and see the veiled London sunset watching him from behind Kensington Palace, and turn away with a guilty sense of detection. The aimless days of waking ghosts of nights came and went, came and went, until his misery became greater than he could bear. The resolutions of the week are as much the result of the period of feeble apathetic inertia that precedes them, as the resolutions of the strong are the outcome of earnest reflection and mental travail. "'It will kill me if it goes on,' he said to himself. There was one way, and one only, by means of which this intolerable weight might be shifted from his shoulders. He hung back many days. He said he could not do that, anything but that. And then he did it. His heart beat painfully as he turned his steps towards Park Lane, and he hesitated many minutes before he mounted the steps and rang the bell at the familiar door of the Tempest townhouse, where his father had lived during the session, where his mother had spent the last years of her life after his death. It was an old-fashioned house. The iron rings into which the links used to be thrust still flanked the ponderous doorway, together with the massive extinguisher. The servant informed him that Mr. Tempest had been out of danger for some days, but was not seeing any one at present. "'Ask him if he will see me,' said Colonel Tempest hoarsely. "'Say I am waiting.' The man left him in the white stone hall, where he and his brother Jack had played as boys. The dappled rocking-horse used to stand under the staircase, but it was no longer there, given away, no doubt, or broken up for firewood. John might have kept the poor old rocking-horse. Recollections that took the form of personal grievances were never far from Colonel Tempest's mind. In a few minutes the man returned and said that Mr. Tempest would see him, and led the way upstairs. A solemn, melancholy-looking valet was waiting for him, who respectfully informed him that the doctor's orders were that his master should be kept very quiet, and should not be excited in any way. Colonel Tempest nodded unheeding and was conscious of a door being opened and his name announced. He went forward hesitatingly into a half-darkened room. "'Pull up the further blind, Marshal,' said John's voice. The servant did so, and noiselessly left the room. Colonel Tempest's heart smote him. The young man lay quite motionless, his dark head hardly raised, his swathed hand stretched out beside him. His unshaved face had the tension of protracted suffering, and the grave, steady eyes which met Colonel Tempest's were bright with suppressed pain. The eyes were the only things that moved. It seemed to Colonel Tempest that if they were closed, 
he shuddered involuntarily. In his morbid fancy the prostrate figure seemed to have already taken the rigid lines of death, the winding sheet to be even now drawn up round the young, haggard face. Colonel Tempest was not gifted with imagination, where he himself was not concerned. He was under the impression that the influenza, from which he occasionally suffered, was the most excruciating form of mortal illness known to mankind. He never believed people were really ill until they were dead. Now he realised for the first time that John had been at death's door. That is to say, he realised what being at death's door was like, and he was fairly staggered. "'Good God, John,' he said with a sort of groan, "'I did not know it has been as bad as this.' "'Sit down,' said John, as the nurse brought forward a chair to the bedside, and then withdrew, eyeing the newcomer suspiciously. "'It is much better now. I received callers. Hemsworth was here yesterday. I can shake hands a little. Only be very gentle with me. I cry like a girl if I am more than touched.' John feebly raised and held out a bandaged hand, of which the end of three fingers were visible. Colonel Tempest, whose own feelings were invariably too deep to admit of his remembering those of others, pressed it spasmodically in his. "'It goes to my heart to see you like this, John,' he said with a break in his voice. John withdrew his hand. His face twitched a little, and he bit his lip, but in a few moments he spoke again firmly enough. "'It is very good of you to come. "'Now that I have got round the corner, "'I shall be about again in no time.' "'Yes, yes,' said Colonel Tempest, "'as if reassuring himself. "'You will be all right again soon.' "'You look knocked up,' said John, "'considering him attentively with his dark, earnest gaze. "'Do I?' said Colonel Tempest. "'I dare say I do. "'Yes, people may not notice it as a rule. "'I keep things to myself, "'always have done all my life, but—' It will drag me into my grave if it goes on much longer, I know that. If what goes on? It is all very well for a nervous rider to look boldly at a hedge two fields away, but when he comes up with it, and feels his horse quicken his pace under him, he begins to wonder what the landing on the invisible other side will be like. There was a long silence, broken only by Lindo, John's Spanish poodle, who, ensconced in an armchair by the bedside, was putting an aristocratic and extended hind leg through an afternoon toilet by means of searching and sustained suction. "'I don't suppose there is a more wretched man in the world than I am, John,' said Colonel Tempest at last. "'There is something on your mind, perhaps?' "'Night and day,' said Colonel Tempest, wishing John would not watch him so closely. "'I have not a moment's peace.' "'You are in money difficulties,' said John, justly divining the only cause that was likely to permanently interfere with his uncle's peace of mind. "'Yes,' said Colonel Tempest. "'I am at my wit's end, and that is the truth.' John's lips tightened a little, and he remained silent. That was why his uncle had come to see him, then. His pride revolted against Colonel Tempest's want of it, against Archie's sponge-like absorption of all John would give him. He felt, and it was no idle fancy of a wealthy man, that he would have died rather than have asked for a shilling. A tempest should be above begging, should scorn to run in debt. John's pride of race resented what was in his eyes a want of honour in the other members of the family of which he was the head. Colonel Tempest was in a position of too much delicacy not to feel hurt by John's silence. He reflected on the invariable meanness of rich men, with a momentary retrospect of how open-handed he had been himself in his youth, and even after his crippling marriage. "'I do not know the circumstances,' said John at last. "'No one does,' said Colonel Tempest. "'Neither have I any wish to know them,' said John, with a touch of haughtiness. "'except in so far as I can be of use to you.' Colonel Tempest found himself very disagreeably placed. He would have instantly lost his temper if he had been a few weeks younger, but the memory of those last few weeks recurred to him like a douche of cold water. Self-interest would not allow him to throw away his last chance of escaping out of Swain's clutches, and he had a secret conviction 
that no storming or passion of any kind would have any effect on that prostrate figure, with the stern and feeble voice and intense fixity of gaze. John had always felt a secret repulsion towards his uncle, though he invariably met him with grave, if distant, civility. He had borne in a proud silence the gradual realisation, as he grew old enough to understand it, that there was a slur upon his name, a shadow on his mother's memory. He believed, as did some others, that his uncle had originated the slanders, impossible to substantiate, in order to wrest his inheritance from him. How could this man, after trying to strip him of everything, even of his name, come to him now for money? John had a certain rigidity and tenacity of mind, an uprightness and severity, which come of an intense love of justice and rectitude, but which in an extreme degree, if not counterbalanced by other qualities, make a hard and unlovable character. His clear-eyed judgment made him look at Colonel Tempest with secret indignation and contempt. But with the harshness of youth, other qualities, rarely joined, went hand in hand. A little knowledge of others is a dangerous thing. It shows itself in sweeping condemnations and severe judgments, and a complacent holding up to the light of the poor foibles and peccadilloes of humanity, which all who will can find. A greater knowledge shows itself in a greater tenderness towards others, the tenderness, as some suppose, of willful ignorance of evil. When or how John had learnt it, I know not, but certainly he had a rapid intuition of the feelings of others. He could put himself in their place, and to do that is to be not harsh. He looked again at Colonel Tempest, and was ashamed of his passing the righteous anger. He realised how hard it might be for an older man to be obliged to ask a young one for money, and he had no wish to make it any harder. He looked at the weak, wretched face with its tortured selfishness, and understood a little, perhaps only in part, but enough to make him speak again in a different tone. "'Do not tell me anything you do not wish, but I see something is troubling you very much. Sometimes things don't look so bad when one has talked them over.' "'I can't talk it over, John,' said Colonel Tempest, with incontestable veracity, softened by the kindness of his tone. But the truth is, nervousness was shutting its eyes and making a rush. I want ten thousand pounds and no questions asked. John was startled. Colonel Tempest clutched his hat and stared out of the window. He felt benumbed. He had actually done it, actually brought himself to ask for it. As his faculties slowly returned to him in the long silence which followed, he became conscious that if John was too niggardly to pay his own ransom, he, Colonel Tempest would not be the most to blame if any casualty should hereafter occur. At last John spoke. You say you don't want any questions to ask, but I must ask one or two. You want this money secretly? Would the vaunt of it bring disgrace upon your children? It nearly said your daughter. If it was found out it would, said Colonel Tempest in a choked voice. The detection, which he always told himself was an impossibility, had nevertheless a horrible way of masquerading before him at intervals as an accomplished fact. John knit his brows. "'I can't pretend not to know what it is,' he said. "'It is a debt of honour. You've been betting.' "'Yes,' said Colonel Tempest faintly. I suppose you can't touch your capital, that is, settled on your children. No, said Colonel Tempest, there were no settlements when I married. I had to do the best I could. I, I had twenty thousand pounds from my father, and my wife brought me a few thousands after her uncle's death, a very few, which her relations could not prevent her having. But there were the children, and one thing with another, and women are extravagant, and must have everything to their liking. And by the time I'd settled up and sold everything after the break-up, it, was all I could do to put Archie to school. Oh, die, die, cold in your grave these two and twenty years. Do you remember the little pile of account books that you wound up and put in your writing-table drawer that last morning in April, thinking that if anything happened he would find them there afterwards? 
He had always inveighed against the meanness of your economy before the servants, and against your extravagance in private. Do you remember the butcher's book, with thin blotting paper, that blotted tears as badly as ink sometimes, for meat was dear? And the milk bills? You were always proud of the milk bills, with the space for cream left blank, except when he was there. And the little book of sundries, where those quarter-pounds of fresh butter and French rolls were entered, which Anne ran out to get if he came home suddenly, because he did not like the cheap butter from the stores? Do you remember these things? He never knew. He never looked at the dumb reproach of that little row of books. But I cannot think, wherever you are, that you have quite forgotten them. John was silent again. How could he deal with this man who roused in him such a vehement indignation? For several minutes he could not trust himself to speak. "'I think I'd better go,' said Colonel Tempest at last. John started violently. "'No, no,' he said. "'Wait, let me think.' The nurse and his aunt came into the room at that moment. "'Are not you feeling tired, sir?' the nurse inquired warningly. "'Yes, John,' said Miss Fane, grunting as her manner was. "'Mustn't get tired.' "'I am not,' he replied. "'Colonel Tempest and I are discussing business matters which won't wait, which it would trouble me to leave unsettled. We have not quite finished, but he is more tired than I am. It is the pottest day we have had. Will you give him a cup of tea, Aunt Flo, and bring him back in half an hour?' When he was left alone, John turned his head painfully on the pillow, and slowly opened and shut one of the bandaged hands. This not altogether satisfactory form of exercise was the only substitute he had within his power for the old habit of pacing up and down what he thought. Ought he to give the money? He had no right to make a bad use of anything, because he happened to have a good deal of it. This ten thousand would follow the previous twenty thousand as a matter of course. Giving it did not affect himself in as much as he would hardly miss it. It was a generous action, only in appearance, for he was very wealthy. Even among the rich he was very rich. His long minority, and various legacies of younger branches, which had shown the Tempest's peculiarity of dying out, and leaving their substance to the head of the family, had added to an already imposing income. In his present mode of life he did not spend a third of it. The thought flashed across his mind that if he had died three weeks ago, if the hinges of the door had held as firmly as the shot lock, and he had perished in that room in King Street like a rat in a trap, Colonel Tempest would at this very moment have been in possession of everything. He looked at his own death, and all it would have entailed, dispassionately. That improvident, selfish man had been within an ace of immense wealth, and yet John's heart smote him. His uncle had been genuinely grieved to see him so ill, had been really thankful to think he was out of danger. He had almost immediately afterwards reverted to himself and his own affairs, but that was natural to the man. He had nevertheless been unaffectedly overcome the moment before. The emotion had been genuine. John struggled hard against his strong personal dislike. Perhaps Colonel Tempest had become entangled in the money difficulty at the very time his, John's, life hung in the balance, when he took for granted he was about to inherit all. The speculation was heartless, perhaps, but pardonable. John saw no reason why Colonel Tempest should not have counted on his death. For ten days it had been more than probable, and now he might live to a hundred. Perhaps the probability of his reaching old age was slenderer than he supposed. He lay a little while longer, and then rang the bell near his hand, and directed his servant to bring him a locked feminine elegancy from a side-table, which, until he could replace his burnt possessions, had evidently been lent him by his aunt to use as a dispatch-box. He got out a cheque-book, and with clumsy fingers filled in and signed a cheque. Then he lay back, panting and exhausted. The will was strong in him, but the suffering body was desperately weak. When Colonel Tempest returned, John held the cheque towards him in silence, with a feeble smile. Colonel Tempest took it without speaking. His lips shook. He was more moved than he had been for years. "'God bless you, John,' 
he said at last. You're a good fellow, and I don't deserve it from you. Good-bye, said John, in a more natural tone of voice than he had yet used towards him. If you are at the polo match on Thursday, will you look in and tell me how it has gone? It would be a kindness to me. I know Archie and Hemsworth are playing. Colonel Tempest murmured something unintelligible and went out. He did not go back at once to his rooms in Brook Street. Almost involuntarily his steps turned towards the park. The world was changed for him. The weary, ceaseless beat of the horses' hoofs on the wood pavement had a cheerful, exhilarating ring. All the people looked glad. There was a confused rejoicing in the rustle of the trees and the flying voices of the children playing and rolling in the grass. He wandered down towards the serpentine. Dogs were rushing in and out of the water. An elastic, cock-eared retriever. An elastic, cock-eared retriever, undepressed by its doubtful ancestry, was leaping and waving a wet tail at its master, giving the short, sharp barks of youth and a light heart. An aristocratic pug in a belled collar was delicately sniffing the evening breeze across the water, watching the antics of the lower orders with protruding eyes, like pieces of toffee rounded and glazed by suction. An equally aristocratic black poodle, Lindo, out for a stroll with a ballet, with more social tendencies, was hurrying up and down on the extreme verge, beckoning rapidly with its short tufted tail to the athletes in the water. The ducks bobbed on the ripples. The children sprawled and shouted and clambered. The low sun had laid a dancing, glancing pathway across the water. How glad it all was! How exceeding glad! Colonel Tempest patted one of the children on the head and felt benevolent. As he turned away at last and sauntered homewards, he passed a little knot of people gathered round a gesticulating open-air preacher. Two girls, arm in arm, just in front of him, were lounging near, talking earnestly together. "'Sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee!' bawled the strident, fanatic voice. "'I shall have mine trimmed with tulle and a flower on the crown,' said one of the girls. Colonel Tempest walked slowly on. "'Yes, yes, that was it. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee.' He had always dreaded that worse thing, and now that fear was all over. He translated the cry of the preacher into a message to himself, his first personal transaction with the Almighty. He felt awed. It was like a voice from another world. Religion was becoming a reality to him at last. There are still persons for whom the law and the prophets are not enough, who require that one should rise from the dead to galvanise their superstition into momentary activity. Sin no more. No, never any more. He had done with the sin. He would make a fresh start from today, and life would become easy and unembarrassed and enjoyable once again. No more nightmares and wakeful nights and nervous haunting terrors. They were all finished and put away. The tears came into his eyes. He regretted that he had not enjoyed these comfortable feelings earlier in life. The load was lifted from his heart, and the removal of the pain was like a solemn joy. End of Book Volume 1, Chapter 11volume 1 chapter 12 of diana tempest by mary chumley this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by simon evers volume 1 chapter 12 on entre on crie c'est la vie on crie on sort c'est la mort on the paths of self-interest the grass is seldom allowed to grow under the feet colonel tempest hurried it would be tedious to follow the various steps feverishly taken which led to his finally unearthing the home address of Mr. Swain. He procured it at last, not without expense, from an impoverished client of that gentleman who had lately been in correspondence with him. Mr. Swain had always shown a decided reticence with regard to the locality of his domestic roof. Colonel Tempest was, of course, in possession of several addresses where letters would find him, but his experience of such addresses had been that unless strictly connected with pecuniary advantage to Mr. Swain, the letters did not seem to reach their destination. 
But now, even when Colonel Tempest wrote to say he would pay up, no answer came. Swain did not rise even to that bait. Colonel Tempest, who was aware that Mr. Swain's faith in human nature had in the course of his career sustained several severe shocks, came to the conclusion that Mr. Swain did not attach importance to his statement, that he indeed regarded it only as a blind in order to obtain another interview. It was on a burning day in June that Colonel Tempest set forth to search out his tempter at Rosemont Villa, Arne Ferry, in the manufacturing town of Bilgewater. The dirty, smudged address was in his pocket-book, as was also the notice of his banker that ten thousand pounds had been placed to his credit a few days before. The London train took him to Worcester, and from thence the local line, after meandering through a desert of grime and chimneys, and after innumerable stoppages at one hideous nigger station after another, finally deposited him on the platform of Bilgewater Junction. Colonel Tempest got out and looked about him. It was not a rural scene. Heaps of refuse and slag lay upon the blistered land, thick as the good resolutions that pave a certain road. Low cottages crowded each other in knots near the high smoking factories. Black wheels turned slowly against the grey of the sky, which whitened upwards towards the ghost of the midsummer sun high in heaven. We are told that the sun shines equally on the just and on the unjust, but that was said before the first factory was built. At Bilgewater it is no longer so. Colonel Tempest inquired his way to Arne Ferry, and, vaguely surprised at Mr. Swain's choice of locality for his country residence, set out along the baked wrinkles of the black high road, winding between wastes of cottages, some inhabited and showing dreary signs of life, some empty and decrepit, some fallen down dead. The heat was intense. The steam and the smoke rose together into the air like some evil sacrifice. The pulses of the factories throbbed feverishly as he passed. The steam curled upwards from the surface of the livid pools and canals at their base. The very water seemed to sweat. Colonel Tempest reached Arne Ferry, being guided thither by the spar of the little tin church, which pointed unheeded toward the low steel sky, shut down over the battered, convulsed country like a coffin lid over one who has died in torment. At Arne Ferry, which had a bridge and a wharf and a canal, and was everything except a ferry, he inquired again concerning Rosemont Villa, and was presently picking his way across a little patch of common towards a string of what had once been red brick houses, which had long since embraced the universal colour of their surroundings. They were rather better-looking houses, if a sort of shabby gentility can be called anything except the worst. They were semi-detached. From out of one of them the strains were issuing faintly and continuously of the inevitable accordion, which for some occult reason is always found to consort with poverty and oyster-shells. At the open door of another a girl was standing, tearing pieces with her teeth out of a chunk of something she held in her hand. She was surrounded by a meagre family of poultry, who fought and pecked and trod each other down with almost human eagerness for the occasional morsels she threw to them. Something in her appearance, and in the way she seemed to enjoy the greed and mutual revilings of her little dependents, reminded Colonel Tempest, he hardly knew why, of Mr. Swain. Another glance made the supposition a certainty. There were the small boot-buttons of eyes, the heavy, mottled, expressionless face which Colonel Tempest had until now considered to be the exclusive property of Mr. Swain. This slouching, tawdry, down-at-heel arrow was no doubt one of that gentleman's quiverful. Mr. Swain had always worn such very unmarried waistcoats and buttonholes that it was a shock to Colonel Tempest to regard him as a domestic character. "'Is Mr. Swain at home?' he asked, amid the cackling and flouncing of the poultry. The arrow, her cheek bulged with the unchewed piece, looked at him doubtfully for a moment, and then called over her shoulder, "'Mother!' The voice, as of a female who had never been held in subjection, answered shrilly from within, "'Well, here's a gent as wants to see father.' There was a sound of some heavy vessel being set down, and a woman, large and swarthy, came to the door. She might have been good-looking once. She might perhaps have been a fine figure of a woman 
in the days when Swain wooed and won her, and no doubt her savings, or his own. But possibly the society of Mr. Swain may not in the long run have exerted an ennobling or even a soothing influence upon her. Her complexion was a fiery red, and her whole appearance bespoke a temperament to which the artificial stimulus of alcohol, though evidently unnecessary, was evidently not denied. Swine's sick, she said, eyeing Colonel Tempest with distrust. He can't see no one, and if he could, there's not a shilling in the house if you want to scrape the walls with a knife. But that's all about it. It's no manner of use coming pestering here for money. I don't want money, said Colonel Tempest. I want to pay, not to be paid. The woman shook her head incredulously, and put out her underlip, uttering the mystic word, Walker! He did not seem to bear upon the subject, but somebody, probably the accordion next door, laughed. "'I must see him,' said Colonel Tempest vehemently. "'I've had dealings with him which I want to settle and have done with. It's in my own interest to pay up. He would see me directly if he knew I was here.' The woman hesitated. "'Swine is uncommon sick,' she said slowly. "'If his business, I doubt he could scarce fettle at it now.' "'Do you mean he is not sober?' "'Oh, he's sober enough, poor fellow,' said Mrs. Swain, with momentary sympathy. "'But he's mortal bad. He hasn't done nothing but dithered with a bit of toast since Tuesday, and taking it out of himself all the time with flouncing and swearing like a brute beast.' "'Is he—do you mean to say he is dying?' demanded Colonel Tempest, in sudden panic. "'Doctor says he won't hang on above a day or two, said the girl, nonchalantly. "'Doctor says his works is clean wore out.' "'Let me go to him at once,' said Colonel Tempest. "'It is of great importance. I must see him at once.' The women stared at each other undecidedly, and the girl nudged her mother. "'Your mother, what does it signify? If the general will make it worth while, show him up.' Colonel Tempest hastily produced a sovereign, and in a few minutes was stumbling up the rickety stairs behind Mrs. Swain. She pushed open a half-closed door, and noisily pulled back a bit of curtain which shaded the light what poor dim light there was, from the bed, knocking over as she did so a tallow candle in the window-sill, bent double by the heat. Colonel Tempest had followed her into the room, and into an atmosphere resembling that of the monkey-house at the zoo, stiffened with brandy. "'Oh, good gracious!' he ejaculated, as Mrs. Swain drew back the curtain. "'Oh, dear Mrs. Swain, I ought to have been prepared. I, I had no idea. What's the matter with him? What is he writing on the wall?' But Mr. Swain was changed. He was within a measurable distance of being unrecognisable. That evidently would be the next alteration, not for the better in him. Already he was slow to recognise others. He was sitting up in bed, swearing and scratching tearfully at the wallpaper. He looked stouter than ever, but as if he might collapse altogether at a pinprick, and shrivel down to a wrinkled nothing among the creases of his tumbled bedding. Mrs. Swain regarded her prostrate lord with arms akimbo. Possibly she considered that her part of the agreement, to love and to cherish Mr. Swain, and honour and obey Mr. Swain, was now at an end, as death was so plainly about to part them. At any rate she appeared indisposed to add any finishing touches to her part of the contract. Mr. Swain had, in all probability, put in his finishing touches with such vigour that possibly a remembrance of them accounted for a certain absence of solicitude on the part of his helpmeet. "'Who's this? Who's this? Who's this?' said Mr. Swain, in a rapid whisper, perceiving his visitor, and peering out of the gloom with a bloodshot, furtive eye. "'Dear, dear, dear! Mary, I'm, I'm busy. I'm pressed for time. Take him away. Quite away. Quite away!' Mr. Swain had been a man of few and evil words when in health. His recording angel would now need a knowledge of shorthand. This sudden flow of language fairly staggered Colonel Tempest. "'I must have out those bonds,' he went on, forgetting his visitor again instantly. "'I can't lay me hand on them, but I've got them somewhere. Top left-hand drawer of the walnut escritoire. I know I have them. I'll make him bleed. Top left-hand. No, 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 no. Where was it, then? Lock stiff. The lock. Break it. I say I will have them. As he spoke, he tore from under the pillow a little footstool having the remnant of a frayed dog in blue beads worked upon it, a conjugal attention, no doubt, on the part of Mrs. Swain, to raise the sick man's head. And Mr. Swain, after endeavouring to unlock the dog's tail, 
smote savagely upon it, and sank back with chattering teeth. "'That's the way he goes on,' said Mrs. Swain. "'Morning, noon, and night. Never a bit of peace except when he gets into his praying fits. I expect he'd go off in one of them tantrums.' It did not appear unlikely that he would go off then and there, but after a few moments a sort of ghastly life seemed to return. Even death did not appear to take him. He opened his eyes and looked round, bewildered. Then his head fell forward. "'Now it's your time,' said the woman, "'before he gets up steam for another of them rages. Parson comes and twitters a bit when he's in this way, and he'll pray very heavy while he recollects himself until he goes off again. It'll be better now for a spell.' and she left the room, and creaked ponderously downstairs again. Colonel Tempest advanced a step nearer the lyre on which poor Swain was taking his last rest but one, and said faintly, "'Swain! I say, Swain, rouse up!' The only thing that roused up was Swain's eyelids. These certainly trembled a little. In the next house the accordion was beginning a new tune, was designating Jerusalem as its happy home. Apprehensive terror for himself, as usual, overcame other feelings. It overcame in this instance the unspeakable repugnance Colonel Tempest felt to approaching any nearer. He touched the prostrate man on the shoulder, with the slender white hand which had served him so exclusively from boyhood upwards, which had never wavered in its fidelity to him to do a hand's turn for others, which shrinkingly did his bidding now. "'Wake up, Swain,' repeated Colonel Tempest, actually stooping over him. "'Wake up for—' He was going to add, for heaven's sake, but the thought of heaven in connection with Swain seemed inappropriate, and he altered it to, for mercy's sake, which sounded just as well. "'Is it the parson?' asked Swain feebly, in a more natural voice. "'No, no,' said Colonel Tempest reassuringly. "'It's only me, a friend. It's Colonel Tempest.' "'I wish it was the parson,' repeated Swain, seeming to emerge somewhat from his torpor. He might have come and led off a few more prayers to me. He says it's all right if I repent, and I suppose he knows, but it don't seem likely. It don't seem as if God could be greened quite as easily as Parson makes out. I should have liked to throw off a few more prayers so as to be on the safe side. And he began to mutter incoherently. As a man lives, so it is said, he generally dies. Swain seemed to remain true to his own interests. Only his aspect of those interests had altered. He felt the awkwardness of going into court absolutely unprepared. Prayer was cheap if it could do what he wanted, and he had professional advice as to its efficacy. A man who all his life can grovel before his fellow creatures may as well alone do a little grovelling before his Creator at the last, if anything is to be got by it. It is to the credit of human nature that, as a rule, Men, even of the lowest type, feel the uselessness, the degradation, of trying to annul their past on their deathbeds. But to Swain, who had never shone a cr as a credit to human nature, a chance remained a chance. He was a gambler and a swindler, a man who had risked long odds, and had been made rich and poor by the drugging of a horse or the forcing of a card. If, in his strict attention to never losing a chance, he had inadvertently mislaid his soul, he was not likely to be aware of it. But a chance was a thing he had never so far failed to, to take advantage of. He was taking his last, now. Colonel Tempest looked at him in horror. The interests of the two men clashed, and at a vital moment. "'For God's sake, don't pray now, Swain,' said Colonel Tempest, appealingly, as Swain began to mutter something more. "'I've come to set wrong right, and that will be a great deal better than any prayers.' Do you more good in the end? Swain did not seem to understand. He looked in a perplexed manner at Colonel Tempest. I don't fear to fetch it outright, he said, but it's in the prayer book on the mantelpiece. That's what our parson reads out of. You get it, Colonel, just get it quick and pray em off one after another. Don't matter much which, they're all good. Swain, said Colonel Tempest in utter desperation, I'll do anything. I'll, I'll pray as much as you like afterwards, if you will only give me up those papers you have against me, those bets. What? said Swain, a gleam of the old professional interest flickering into his face. You ain't got the money. Yes, here, here. And Colonel Tempest tore the banker's note out of his pocket-book, and held it before Swain's eyes. I was to have had twenty-five per cent commission, said Swain, 
rallying perceptibly at the thought. Twenty-five per cent on each. I wouldn't let them go at less. Two thousand five hundred, I should have made. But— With a sudden restless relapse. No use thinking of that now. Get down the book, Colonel. But for once Colonel Tempest was firm. Perhaps his indignation against Swain's egotism enabled him to be so. He made Swain understand that business must in this instance come first, and prayers afterwards. It was a compact, not the first, between the two. "'The papers!' he repeated over and over again, frantic of the speed with which the last links of Swain's memory seemed falling from him. "'Where are they? You have them with you, of course. Tell me where they are!' And he grasped the dying man by the shoulder. Swain was frightened back to some semblance of effort. "'I haven't got them. He gasped. The, 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 the chaps engaged in the business have them. But you know who have got them? Here, yeah, of course, it's all written down somewhere. Where? But Swain did not rightly know. He had the addresses in cipher somewhere, but he could not put his hand upon them. Half wild with fear, Colonel Tempest searched the pockets of the clothes that lay about the room, holding up their contents for Swain to look at. It was like some hideous game of hide-and-seek but the latter only shook his head. "'I have them somewhere,' he repeated, "'and there was a change not so long ago. When was it? May. There's one of them written down in cipher in my pocket-book in May. I know that.' "'Here, this one,' said Colonel Tempest, holding out a greasy pocket-book. "'That's it,' said Swain. "'Sometime in May.' Colonel Tempest turned to the month, and actually found a page with a faint pencil scrawl in cipher across it. "'That's him,' said Swain. James Larkin. And he read out a complicated address without difficulty. Will that find him? asked Colonel Tempest, his hand shaking so much that he could hardly write down Swain's words. If it's to his advantage, it will. For certain? Certain. And the others? There's one dead, said Swain, his voice waxing feebler and feebler as the momentary galvanism of Colonel Tempest's terror lost its effect. "'And there's two I had back the papers from. "'They were sick of it, and they said he had a charmed life. "'One of them went to America and married and set up respectable. "'I have his paper, too. "'And one of them's in quad. "'But he'd be out soon, I reckon, and it'd be good for, for another try. "'He precious near bought it off last time. "'There's a few left that still bide in their time. "'There! And I won't hear nothing more about it. "'Get to the prayers, Colonel, and be quick. "'Parson might have come again, damn him!' "'Stop a minute.' "'Can I get at the others through Larkin?' Swain had sunk back, spent and livid. He looked at Colonel Tempest with fixed and glassy eyes. "'Yes,' he said with the ghost of an oath. "'Get to the prayers.' Colonel Tempest was still trembling with the relief from that horrible nightmare of suspense as he opened the shiny new prayer-book which the clergyman had left. He held the first link. He had now only to draw the whole chain through his hand and break it to atoms, a chain that was dragging him down to hell. He hastily began to read. God had heard many prayers, but perhaps not many like those which ascended from that hideous, tumbled deathbed, where kneeling self-interest halted through the supplication, and prostrate self-interest gasped out, Amen. Ha! Huh. Did he who first taught us how to pray, did he, raised high upon the cross of an apparent failure, Look down the ages that were yet to come, and see how we should abuse that gift of prayer? Was that bitter cry which had echoed through eighteen hundred years wrung from him, even for our sakes, also as well as those who stood around him? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Colonel Tempest was still on his knees when the door was softly opened, and a young, a very young, clergyman came in and knelt down beside him, clasping his thin hands over the collapsed felt souffle which did duty for a hat. After stumbling to the end of the prayer he was reading, Colonel Tempest put the book into his hand, and escaped. He stole down the stairs and passed the little sitting-room unobserved. He was out again in the open air, the live, free air, which seemed freshness itself after the atmosphere of that sick-room. He held the clue. He had it. He held it. He was safe. God was on his side now, and was helping him to make restitution. 
At one despairing moment, when he'd been tearing even the linings out of the pockets of Swain's checked trousers, he feared that Providence had deserted him. Now that he had the pocket-book, he regretted his want of faith. I do not think his mind reverted once to Swain, for Swain was no longer of any interest to him, now that he was out of Swain's power. Colonel Tempest did not exactly forget people, but his mind was so constituted that everything with which it came in contact was wiped out the moment it had ceased to affect or group itself round himself. His imagination did not follow his colleague's last faltering steps upon that steep brink where each must one day stand. His mind turned instinctively to the most frivolous subjects, was back in London wondering what he would have for dinner if he had dined with Archie as he had intended, was anxious to know how many cigarettes of that new brand he had put into his case before he left London that morning. Colonel Tepis stopped, got out his cigarette case and counted them. Those who have known Colonel Tempis best, those few who had misunderstood and loved him, had often pondered with grave anxiety, or with the wistful perplexity of wounded affection, as to what it was in him that being so impressionable was yet incapable of any real impression. His wife may or may not have mastered that expensive secret. At any rate, she had had opportunities of studying it. When first, a few weeks after her marriage, she had fallen ill, she, poor fool, had suffered agonies from the fear that because he hardly came into her sick-room after the first day, he had ceased to, to care for her. But when after a few days more she was feeling better, and was pretty and interesting again in a pink wrapper on the sofa, she had found that he was as devoted to her as ever, and had confided her foolish dread to him with happy tears. Possibly she discovered at last that the secret lay not so much in the selfishness and self-indulgence of a character moth-eaten by idleness, as is in the instant and invariable recoil of the mind from any subject that threatened to prove disagreeable, the determination to avoid everything irksome, wearisome, or reproachful. For a moment, while it was quite new, a sentiment might be indulged in. But as soon as a certain novelty and pleasure in emotion ceased, the feeling itself was shirked, at whatever expense to others. Those who shirk are ill to live with, and lay up for themselves an increasing loneliness as life goes on. Colonel Tempest found it unpleasant to think about Swain, so he thought of something else. He could always do that unless he himself was concerned. Then, indeed, as we have seen, it was a different thing. He was annoyed when, after slowly picking his way back to the station, he found the last passenger train had just gone, that even if he drove fifteen miles into Worcester he should be too late to catch the last express to London. In fact, there was nothing for it but a bed at the station inn. He found, however, that by making a very early start from Bilgewater the following morning, he could reach London by noon, and so resigned himself to his lot with composure. He had hardly expected he should be able to go and return in one day. It was indeed early when he walked across to the station next morning, so early that there was a suspicion of freshness in the air, of colour in the eastern sky. On a heap of slag, a motionless figure was sitting, black against the skyline, looking towards the east. It was the curate, who, when he perceived Colonel Tempest, came crunching and flapping in his long coat-tails down to the road below, raised his hat from a meagre clerical brow, and held out his hand. His face was thin and poor, suggested of a starved mind and cold mutton and piercing on, on the creed, but the smile redeemed it. "'It is all over,' he said, half an hour ago, quite quietly at the last. I stayed with him through the night. I never left him. We prayed together without ceasing.' Colonel Tempest did not know what to say. "'It was too late to go to bed,' continued the young man impassively, his face working. So I came here. I often come and sit on that ash heap to see the sun rise. I am so glad just to have seen you again. I long to thank you for those prayers by poor Mr. Crosby's bed. You know the scripture, where two or three are gathered together. I thought it was so true. I have lost heart so of late. No one seems to care or think about these things down here. But your coming and praying like that has been such a help, such a reproach to me for my want of faith when I think that the seed falls on the rock. 
I shall take courage again now. Ah, you going by this train? Good-bye. God bless you. Thank you again. End of Volume 1 Chapter 12Volume One, Chapter Thirteen of Diana Tempest by Mary Chumley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Volume One, Chapter Thirteen. Every man's progress is through a succession of teachers. Emerson. As John slowly climbed to the hill of convalescence, many visitors came to relieve his solitude, and one of those who came the oftenest was Lord Frederick Fane. Lord Frederick was a square-shouldered, well-preserved, well-set-up, carefully padded man of close on sixty, with a thin-lipped, bloodless face and faded eyes divided by a high nose. "'Do you like that man?' said Lord Hemsworth to John one day when he was sitting with him, and Lord Frederick sat up to know whether the latter would see him. "'No,' said John. "'But you seem to see a good deal of him.' "'He is civil to me, and I am not rude to him.' "'He is a relation, you know.' "'I can't stand him,' said Lord Hemsworth. "'If he's coming up, I shall bolt.' And Lord Frederick entering at that moment, Lord Hemsworth took his departure. "'You're better, John,' said Lord Frederick, looking at him through his half-closed eyes, and settling himself gently in a high chair, his hat and one glove and crutch-handled stick held before him in his broad, lean hand. "'I feel more human,' said John, "'now that I'm shaved and dressed.' When I saw myself in the glass yesterday for the first time, I thought I was Darwin's missing link. "'You look more human,' said Lord Frederick, crossing one leg over the other, and then contemplating his white spats for a change. "'Able to attend to business again yet?' "'Not yet. I've tried, but I'm as weak as a worm that can't turn.' "'Pity,' said Lord Frederick, glancing at a sheaf of letters and some opened telegrams on the table at John's elbow. "'Things always happen at inconvenient times,' he went on. Old Charlesworth might have chosen a more opportune moment to die and leave Marshamley vacant again. He's not dead yet. I suppose both sides have been at you already, f to stand for it yourself, as did Lord Frederick. Yes, I thought so. Silence. Are you going to stand? What is your opinion on the subject? I see you have one. Well, said Lord Frederick, I look at it this way. I have often said, don't tie yourself. I'm all for young men keeping their hands free and seeing the ins and outs of life before they settle down. But you are not so very young, and a time comes when a sort of annoyance attaches to freedom itself. It's a bore. As to this seat, indecision is all very well for a time. It enhances a man's value. You were quite right not to stand three years ago. It made you of more importance. But that won't do much longer. You are bound to come to a decision for your own advantage. Neutral ground is sometimes between two fires. I should say, stand, if you ask me. Throw in your lot with the side on which you are most likely to come to the front, and stand. And private opinions? How about them, if they don't happen to fit? Throw them overboard? Yes, said Lord Frederick. It's got to be done sooner or later. Why not sooner? A freelance is no matter of use. There's a hitch somewhere in you, John, that if you don't look out will damn your career as a public man. I don't know what your politics are. My own opinion between ourselves is that you have not got any. But you are bound to have some, and you may as well join forces with what will bring you forward most, and start young. That's my advice. Thanks. There's not a man in the world with an ounce of brains which has not high-flown ideas at your age, continued Lord Frederick. I've had them. Everybody's had them. You buy them with your first razors. People generally sicken with them just when they could make a push for themselves. And while they're getting better, youth and opportunity pass, and don't come back. Seen it over and over again. Every young fool with a ginger moustache, when he first starts in public life, is going to be a patriot, and do his damn thinking for himself. He might as well make his own clothes, and expect society to receive him in them. By the time he's bald, he's learnt better, and he's a party man. But he's lost time in the meanwhile. He may depend upon it. A strong party man is what is wanted. The country doesn't want individuals with brains. They are mostly kicked out in the end. If you don't want to go with the crowd, don't go against it, but throw yourself into it heart and soul, and get in front of it on its own road. It's no good coming to the fore, 
unless you have a following. Thanks, said John again. His face was expressionless as a mask. He looked, as he lay back in his low couch, a strange mixture of feebleness and power. It was as if a strong man armed kept watch within a house tottering to its fall. He put out his muscular, powerless hand, and took up one of the telegrams. "'Charlesworth is not dead yet,' he said. Lord Frederick could take a hint. "'His death will put the Mortons in mourning again,' he remarked. "'Mrs. Morton's ball is doomed. I'm sorry for the woman. She is cumbered with much time-serving, and her ball fell through last year. This is the second time it has happened. I have been asking her young men for her. I put down your cousin of the guards, the Apollo with the tow-wig. What's his name? Uh, Tempest? Archibald. Yes. That would be a dangerous man if he were not such a fool. But the same placard that says he is to let says he is unfurnished, and it's poor work taking an empty house when it comes to living in it. Women know that. He's let the soda-water heiress slip through his fingers. She's going to marry young Topham. I thought Apollo seemed rather down on his luck when it was first given out, but he's consoled himself since. Apparently he has a mission to married women. He's always with Lady Verelst now. I saw him riding with her again this morning. I don't know who mounted him, but he was on the best horse I've seen this season. You're not such a fool, such a philanthropist as to lend him horses, are you? When I can't use them myself, I have that amount of generosity. Ha! Huh. Well, he makes good of use of his opportunities to cheer up Lady Verelst. I wish you would flirt more with married women, John. You would find your account in it. I did at your age. You see, you are too eligible to go on much with girls, and that's the truth. You'd be watched. But you don't pay enough attention to women, and three-quarters of the world is made up of them. You're too much of a Puritan. But you may remember human nature is like a short-footed stocking. If you darn it up at the hill, it will come out of the toe. It's no manner of use to ignore women. People who do always come the worst croppers in the end. A flirtation with a fast married woman would peel your illusions off you like the skin off an orange. All young men believe in women, till they know them. Ha! <laughs> ha! If I were a rabbit, I should take a personal interest in the habits of birds of prey. I told Hemsworth something of the kind the other day, but he is bent on making a fool of himself. He knows his own affairs best. I fancy I know them better than he does. Miss Dye is young, but she's uncommonly well aware of her own value, and she's looking higher. I should not wonder if she tried to marry you. She'll take him in five years' time, if he's still willing, and she outstands her market. But in the meantime she keeps him dangling. I told him so, and that I admired her for it. She holds her head high, but she is a splendid creature, and no mistake. She has not that expectant, anxious look about her that you see in other girls. She's not made up. Sterling good looks in her case. If you are interested in that quarter, you may take my word for it. It is all genuine, even to her hair. That is why her frank manner is so telling. It's of a piece with the rest. She knows how to play their cards. The old woman has taught her a thing or two. What a knowledge you have of human nature. I've looked about, said Lord Frederick rising as gently as he had sat down and pulling up his shirt-collar. I have my eyes open pretty young, and I've kept them open ever since. Glad you're better. That black devil in tights of a poodle wants shaving as much as you did last time I saw you. No, don't rig for that melancholy valet. I'll let myself out. I dare say I shall be in again in the course of a day or two. Ta-da! John crushed the telegram he was still holding into a hard ball as soon as his self-constituted guide philosopher, and friend, had left the room. Cynicism was not new to him. It is cheap enough to be universally appropriated by the poor in spirit, for whom generosity and tolerance are commodities too expensive to be indulged in. Our belief in human nature is a foot-rule by which we may be accurately measured ourselves. There are those in whose enlightened eyes purity herself is only a courtesan in fancy dress. John had already had many teachers, for he was a man who was being educated regardless of expense. But perhaps to no two persons did he owe so much as to Mr. Goodwin and Lord Frederick Fane. Our elders act as danger signals oftener than they know. John's room looked out across the park. 
His couch had been drawn near the open window, and to lie and watch the passing crowd of carriages and pedestrians was almost as much excitement as he could bear after the darkened rooms and enforced quiet of the last few weeks. John, with Linda erect on the vacant chair beside him, saw Lord Frederick's hansom, with his pale profile inside it, turn down Park Lane below his windows. Pain had burned all John's energy out of him for the time, and he had soon forgotten his annoyance in watching the people attempting to cross the thoroughfare and in counting the omnibuses that passed. It was all he was up to. It was about five in the afternoon, and carriage after carriage turned into the park at the gates opposite his window. There went Lady Delmore with her brand-new daughter, a sweet wild rose from the country that must be perfected by London smuts and gaslight. John pointed her out to Lindo, but he only yawned and looked the other way. There was Mrs. Barker walking with her husband. Those two white parasols he had danced with somewhere, but he could not put a name to them. Neither could Lindo when asked. Another red omnibus. This was the tenth red one within the last half hour. Royalty went flashing by, bowing and bowed to. John obliged Lindo, whom he suspected of democratic tendencies, to make a bow also. He hoped his nurse would not come in and send him back to bed yet. It was really very interesting watching the passers-by. Was that? No, it was not. Yes, it was, Lady Verelst with red parasol and husband to match, in the Victoria with the greys. There was actually Duchess, his old polo pony, whom he had not seen since he sold her three years ago, looking as spry as ever. John craned his neck to see the last of the bobtail of his old favourite whisk round the corner. A moment later, Mrs. Courtney and Di, erect and fair beside her, spun past in the opposite direction. Before he had time to realise it, he had seen her, almost before he had recognised her, the momentary glimpse struck him like a blow. His head swam, his heart, so languid the moment before, leapt up and struggled like a maddened, caged animal. She had passed some time before he was conscious of anything but the one fact that he had seen her. He stumbled to his feet and walked unsteadily across the room, clutching at the furniture. He seemed to have left his legs behind. "'What am I doing?' he said to himself half aloud, holding on to and swaying against a table. "'What has happened? Why did I get up?' He dragged himself back to his couch again, and sank down, exhausted. The excursion had been too much for him. He had not walked so far before. He was bewildered. Through the open window came the jingle and the clip-clop and the hum. Another red omnibus passed. But there was a loud knocking at the door of John's heart that deafened him to all beside. The peremptory knocking, as of one armed with a claim, who stood without, and would not be denied. End of Volume 1, Chapter 13 End of Volume 1Volume 2, Chapter 1 of Diana Tempest by Mary Chumley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Volume 2, Chapter 1. The fact is, I have never loved anyone well enough to put myself into a noose for them. It is a noose, you know. George Eliot. It was the middle of July. The season had reached the climax which precedes a collapse. The heat was intense. The pace had been too great to last. The rich sane were already on their way to Scotch Moor or Norwegian River. The rich insane and the poor remained, and people with daughters, assiduously entertaining the dwindling numbers of the uncertain, coy, and hard-to-please jeunesse dorée of the present day. There were some great weddings fixed for the end of July, proving that marriage was not extinct. Prospective weddings which, like iron rivets, held the crumbling fabric of the season together. If the unusual heat had driven away half the world, still the greater part of the little world mentioned in these pages remained. Not quite all, for Sir Henry and Lady Verelst had departed rather suddenly for Norway, and Lord Frederick was drinking the water at Homburg or Aix, and thriving on a beverage 
which never passed his lips without admixture in his own country, except in connection with the toothbrush. But John and his aunt Miss Fane were still in the large, cool house in Park Lane. Lord Hemsworth was still baking himself, for no apparent reason, in his rooms over his club. Mrs. Courtney and I were still in town, because they could not afford to go until their country visits began. "'Oh, Granny,' said Di one afternoon, as they sat together in the darkened drawing-room, "'let us cut everything. Do be ill, and let me write round to say we've been obliged to leave town.' Mrs. Courtney shook her head. "'We can't go till we have somewhere to go to, and we are not due at Archelot till the first of August.' "'Could we not afford a week, just one week, of the sea first? "'No, Di,' said Mrs. Courtney. "'I have thought it over. "'Only the rich can have their cake and eat it. "'We had a Victoria for a fortnight in June. "'That meant no seaside this year.' "'There was a pause. "'I wish I were married,' said Di, "'looking affectionately at Mrs. Courtney's pale face. "'I wish I had a rich, kind husband. "'I would not mind if he parted his hair down the middle, "'or even if he came down to breakfast in slippers. "'If only he would give me everything I wanted.' and he should stay up in London, and we would run down to the seaside together, G, first class. I'm not sure I shall not take a coupé for you. And you should go out on the sands in the donkey chairs that your soul loves, and have ice on the butter and cream in the tea. And in the evening we would sit on the first-floor balcony, no more second floors if I were rich, and watch a cool moon rising over a cool sea. I wish moonlight on the sea were not so expensive. "'The beauties of nature are very dear, Granny. "'Sunsets cost money nowadays.' "'Everything costs money,' said Mrs. Courtney. "'Di was silent a little while. "'It was too hot to talk except at intervals. "'I don't think I mind being poor,' she said at last. "'For myself, I mean. "'I've looked at being poor in the face, "'and it is not half so bad as rich people seem to think. "'I mean our kind of poorness. "'Of course,' "'Not the poverty of nothing a year, and ten children to educate, who ought never to have been born. "'But some people think that the kind of means, like ours, which narrow down pleasures, "'and check one at every turn, and want a sharp tug to meet at the end of the year, "'are a dreadful misfortune. "'Really, I don't see it. "'Of course it is annoying being less well off than any of our friends. "'And now I come to think of it, all the people we know are richer than ourselves. "'I wonder how it happens.' "'But there is something rather interesting, after all, in combating small means. "'Look at that screen I made you last year, "'and think of the gnawing envy it has awakened in the hearts of friends. "'It was a close horse once, but genius was brought to bear upon it, "'and it is a very imposing object now. "'And then my dear Emersons, all eleven of them. "'I don't think I could have valued them so much, "'or have been so furious with Jane for spilling water on one of them, "'if they had not emerged one by one out of my glove and shoe money.' "'Oh, my dear, poverty does not matter. "'Nothing matters while you are young and strong. "'But it presses hard when one is growing old. "'Money eases everything.' "'I feel that, and sometimes when I see you "'working a sovereign out of the neck "'of that hoddy little wooden jug in the writing-table drawer, "'I simply long for money for your sake "'that you may never be worried about it any more. "'Sometimes I should like it for the sake "'of all the lovely places in the world that other people go to, people who only remember the table d'hote dinners when they come back, and the books that I cannot afford, and the pictures that seem my very own, and they belong to someone else, and the kind things one could do to poor people who could not return them, which rich people don't seem to think of. Rich people's kindnesses are always so expensive. Yes, I long for money sometimes, but all the time I know I don't really care about it. There seems to be no pleasure in having anything, if there's no difficulty in getting it. I'd rather marry a poor man with brains, do my best with his small income, and help him up, than spend a rich man's money. Anyone could do that. I fear I shall never take you to the seaside, my own G, or send you prepaid hampers of hothouse flowers, or game, after Mr. Dye's battues, for I am certain Providence intends me to be a poor man's wife, if I enter the holy estate at all, because I I should make such a good one. You would make a good wife, Di. But I sometimes think you will never marry, said Mrs. Courtney, sadly. She felt the heat. 
"'Well, Granny, I won't say I feel sure I shall never marry, because all girls say that, and it generally means nothing. But still, that is what I feel without saying it. Do you remember poor old Aunt Bell when she was dying, and how nothing pleased her, and how she said at last, "'I want, I want, I don't know what I want?' Well, when I come to think of it, I really don't know what I want. I know what I don't want. I don't want a kind, indulgent husband, and a large income, and good horses, and pretty little frilled children with their mother's eyes, that one shows to people and is proud of. It's all very nice. I'm glad when I see other people happy like that. I should like to see you pleased. But for myself, really, I think I should find them rather in the way. I dare say I might make a good wife, as you say. I believe I could be rather a cheerful companion, and affectionate, if it was not exacted of me. But somehow all that does not hit the mark. The men who have cared for me have never seemed to like me for myself, or to understand the something behind the chatter and the fun which is the real part of me, which, if I married one of them, would never be brought into play, and would die of starvation. The only kind of marriage I have ever had a chance of seems to me like a sort of suicide. It seems as if it would be one's best self that would be killed, while the other self, the well-dressed, society-loving, ball-going, easy-going self, would be all that was left to me, and would dance upon my grave. Mrs. Courtney was silent. She never ridiculed any thought, however crude and young, if it were genuine. She was one of the few people who knew whether Di was in fun or in earnest, and she knew she was in earnest now. "'There are such things as happy marriages,' she said. "'Yes, Granny, but I think it is the happy marriages I see which makes me afraid of marrying. I know it is foolish to expect to meet with anything better than the ordinary happy marriage, and one ought to be thankful if one met with that, for half the world does not. But when I see what is called a happy marriage, I always think, is that all? Somebody who believes everything I do is right, however silly it is, and knows how many lumps of sugar I take in my tea, like Arnold and Lily. People point at that marriage as such a model, because they have been married two years, and are still as silly as they were. But whenever I stay with them, and she talks nonsense, and he thinks it is all the wisdom of Solomon, and she gives him a blotting-pad, and he gives her a fan, and they look at each other, and then run races in the garden, and each waits for the other, and they come in hand in hand, as if they had done something clever, Whenever I behold those things, it all seems to me a sort of game that I should be ashamed to play at, and I feel, if that is all, at least all I ought to expect, that it is a kind of happiness I don't care to have. Must love be always a sort of pretense, Granny, and such a blind, silly, unreasoning feeling when it does exist? If ever I fall in love, shall I set up an assortment of lamentable, ludicrous illusions about some commonplace young man? as Lily does about that pink Arnold. Can't love be real, like hate? Can't people ever look at each other, and see each other as they are, and love each other for what they are? The Lilies and the Arnolds would not marry if they saw each other as they are, my dear, and they would miss a great deal of happiness in consequence. There would be very few marriages if there were no illusions. Di was silent. Mrs. Courtney stitched a resolution into her lace-work, concerning a man whom no one could call commonplace, and presently spoke again. "'You are confusing being in love with love itself,' she said. "'The one is common to vulgarity, the other rare, at least between men and women. It is the best thing life has to offer. But I have noticed that those who believe in it, and hope for it, and refuse the commoner love for it, generally, remain unmarried. And now, my dear, send down Evans with my black lace mantilla and my new bonnet, for Mrs. Darcy said she would lend us her carriage for the afternoon, and it comes at five. Put on a white gown and make yourself look cool. I must call on Miss Fane, and afterwards we will go down and see the pony races at Hurlingham. Lord Hemsworth sent us tickets for today. He's riding, I think. End of Volume 2 Chapter 1《Volume Two, Chapter Two of Diana Tempest by Mary Chumley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers.
Volume 2, Chapter 2 The Little Waves Make the Large Ones and Are of the Same Pattern George Eliot John was dragging himself feebly across the hall to the smoking-room, after a dutiful cup of tea with his aunt, who was prostrate with a headache, when the doorbell rang, and he saw the champing profiles of a pair of horses through one of the windows. Following his masculine instincts, he hurried across the hall with all the celerity he could muster, and had just got safe under cover when the footman answered to the bell. His ear caught the name of Mrs. Courtney through the open door of the smoking-room, and presently, though he knew Miss Fane did not consider herself well enough to be able to see visitors, there was a slow rustling across the hall and up the stairs, accompanied by a light, firm footfall that could hardly belong to James, whose elephantine rush had so often disturbed him when he was ill. As James came down again, John looked out of the smoking-room door. "'Who is with Miss Fane?' Uh, "'Mrs. Courtney, sir.' "'Anyone else?' Uh, "'No, sir. Miss Fane could only see Mrs. Courtney. Uh, Miss Tempest has come with her, is in the gold drawing-room.' John shut the smoking-room door and went and looked out of the window. It was not a cheerful prospect, but that did not matter much, as he happened to be looking at it without seeing it. Lindo got up on a chair and looked solemnly out too, rolling the whites of his eyes occasionally as his master from under his bushy brows, and yawning long tongue-curling yawns of sheer ennui. The cowls on the chimney-pots twirled, the dead plants on the leads were still dead. The cook's canary was going up and down on his two perches like a machine. John reflected that it was rather a waste of canary power, but perhaps there was nothing to hold back for it in its bachelor existence. It would stand still enough presently when it was stuffed. Could he get upstairs by himself? That was the question. He could come down, but that was not of much interest to him just now. Could he get up again? Only the first floor, shallow stairs, sit down halfway. Awkward to be found sitting there, certainly. One thing was certain, that he was not going to be conveyed up in Marshall's solemn embrace as heretofore. John reflected that he must begin to walk by himself some time, why not now? Very slowly, of course. Why not now? It certainly was slow. But the stairs were shallow. There were balusters. It was done at last. If that alpine summit, the upper mat, was finally reached on hands and knees, who was the wiser? John was breathless but triumphant. His hands were a trifle black, but what of that? The door of the gold drawing-room was open. It was a historic room, the decoration of which had been left untouched since the days when the witty Mrs. Tempest, whom Gainsborough painted, held her salon there. It was a long, pillared room. Curtains of some old-fashioned pale gold brocade, not made now, hung from the white pillars and windows. The gold-coloured walls were closely lined with dim pictures from the ceiling to the old Venetian leather of the dado. Tall, gilt eastern figures, life-size, meant to hold lamps, stood here and there, raising their empty hands, hideous, but peculiar to the room, with its bygone stately taste, and stiff white and gilt chairs and settees. John drew aside the curtain, and then hesitated. A family of tall white lilies in pots were gathered together in one of the further windows. Di was standing by them, turned towards him, but without perceiving him. She had evidently introduced herself to the lilies as a friend of the family, and was touching the heads of those nearest to her, very gently, very tenderly, with one finger. She stood in the full light, like some tall, splendid lily, herself, against the golden background. John drew in his breath. It was his house. They were his lilies. The empty setting which seemed to claim her for its own, to group itself so naturally round her, was all his. There was a tremor of prophecy in the air. His brain seemed to turn slowly round in his head. He'd come upstairs too quickly. His hand clutched the curtain. He felt momentarily incapable of stirring or speaking. The old physical pain, which only loosed him at intervals, tightened its thongs. But he dreaded to see her look up and find him watching her. He went forward and held out his hand in silence. Di looked up, and her expression changed instantly. A lovely colour came into her face, and her eyes shone. She advanced quickly towards him. 
"'Oh, John,' she said, "'is it really you? "'I was afraid we should not see you before we left town. "'But you ought not to stand.' John's complexion was passing from white to ashen grey to pale green. "'Sit down.' She held both his passive hands in hers. She would not for worlds have let him see that she thought he was going to faint. "'This is a nice chair by the window,' drawing him gently to it. "'I was just admiring your lilies. "'You will let me ring for a cup of tea, I know. "'I am so thirsty.' It was done in a moment, and she was back again beside him, only a voice now, a voice among the lilies, which appeared and disappeared at intervals. One tall, furled lily-head came and went with astonishing celerity, and the voice spoke gently and cheerfully from time to time. It was like a wonderful dream in a golden dusk. And then there was a little clink and clatter, and a cup of tea suddenly appeared close to him out of the darkness, and there was Di's voice again, and a momentary glimpse of Di's earnest eyes, which did not match her tranquil, unconcerned voice. He drank the tea mechanically without troubling to hold the cup, which seemed to take the initiative with a precision and an independence of support which would have surprised him at any other time. The tea, what little there was of it, was the nastiest he had ever tasted. It might have been made in a brandy bottle. But it suddenly cleared the air. Gradually the room came back, the light came back. He came back himself. It was all hardly credible. There was Di sitting opposite to him, evidently quite unaware that he had been momentarily overcome, and assiduously engaged in pouring out another cup of tea. She had taken off her gloves, and he watched her cool, slender hands give herself a lump of sugar. Only one small lump, John observed. He must remember that. Then she filled up the teapot from the little gurgling silver kettle. What forethought! Wonderful! And yet apparently also natural. She seemed to do it as a matter of course. He ought to be helping her, but somehow he was not. Would she take bread and butter, or one of those little round things? She took a piece of bread and butter. Perhaps it would be as well to listen to what she was saying. He lost the first part of the sentence because she began to stir her tea at the moment, and he could not attend to two things at once. But presently he heard her say, "'Mrs. Courtney thinks young people ought not to mind missing tea altogether. "'But I do mind, don't you? "'I think it is the pleasantest meal in the day.' "'John cautiously assented that it was. "'He felt that he must be very careful, "'or a slight dizziness which was now rapidly passing off might be noticed. "'Di went on talking unconcernedly, "'bending her burnished golden head in its little white bonnet over the teacups. She seemed to, to take a great interest in the tea-things and the date of the apostle spoons. Presently she looked at him again, and a relieved smile came into her face. "'Are you ready for another cup?' she said. And it was not a dream any longer, but all quite real and true, and he was real too. "'No, thanks,' said John, taking his cup with extreme deliberation from the table at his elbow, where he supposed he had set it down. There is something wrong about the tea, I think. Do send yours away and have some more. It has a very odd taste. Has it? said Di, meeting his eye firmly, but with an effort. I don't notice it. On the contrary, I think it is rather good. Try another cup. Perhaps the water did not boil, suggested John feebly, reflecting that his temporary indisposition might have been the cause of his dislike, but anxious to conceal the fact. "'That is a direct reflection on my tea-making,' said Di. "'You had better be more careful what you say.' And she quickly pushed a stumpy little liqueur-bottle behind the silver tea-caddy. "'I beg pardon, and ask humbly for another cup,' said John, smiling. The pain had left him again, as it generally did after he had remained quiet for a time, and in the relief from it he had a vague impression that the present moment was too good to last. He did not know that it was usual to wash out a cup so carefully as Di did his, but she seemed to think it the right thing, and she probably knew. Anyhow, the second cup was capital. John was not allowed to drink tea. The doctors who were knitting firmly together again, the slender threads that had so far bound him to this world, believed he was imbibing an emulsion of something rather strengthening and nauseous at that moment. "'Oh, there is a tea-cake,' said Di 
discovering another dish behind the kettle. "'Why did I not see it before?' "'It is not too late, I hope,' said John, anxiously. The stupidity of James in putting a tea-cake, which might have been preferred to bread and butter, out of sight behind an opaque kettle, caused him profound annoyance. But Di could not take a personal interest in the tea-cake. She looked back at the lilies. "'Don't you long to be in the country?' she said. "'I find myself dreaming about green fields and flowers gratis. I have not seen a country lane since Easter, and then it rained all the time. It is three years since I have found a hedge-sparrow's nest with eggs in it. Don't you long to get away?' "'I long to get back to Overley,' said John. "'I went there for a few days in the spring on my return from Russia. "'The place was looking lovely, but,' he added as it were a matter of course, "'naturally Overley always looks beautiful to me.' "'Di did not answer. "'You know the wood below the house,' he went on. "'When I saw it last, all the rhododendrons were out.' "'I have never seen Overley,' said Di looking at the lilies again, and trying to speak unconcernedly. She knew Lord Hemsworth's tiresome old border castle. She visited at many historic houses. She and Mrs. Courtney were going to some sort shortly. But her own family place, the one house of all others in the whole world which she would have cared to see, she had never seen. She had often heard about it from acquaintances, had looked wistfully at drawings of it in illustrated magazines, had questioned Mrs. Courtney and Archie about it, had wandered in imagination in its long gallery and down the lichened steps from the postern and the wall that every artist vignetted to the stone-flagged Italian gardens below. But with her bodily eyes she had never beheld it, and the longing returned at intervals. It had returned now. "'Will you come and see it?' said John, looking away from her. It seemed to him that he was playing a game in which he had staked heavily against someone who had staked nothing, who was not even conscious of playing, and might inadvertently knock over the board at any moment. He felt as if he had noiselessly pushed forward his piece, and as if everything depended on the withdrawal of his hand from it unobserved. "'I have wished to see Everly from a child,' said Di, flushing a little. "'Think what you feel about it, and my father, and our grandfather. Well, I am a tempest, too.' John was vaguely relieved. He glanced from her to the Gainsborough in the feathered hat that hung behind her. There was just a touch of resemblance under the unlikeness, a look in the pose of the head, in its curled and powdered wig, that had reminded him of Di before. It reminded him of her more than ever now. "'Archie has been to Everly so constantly that I had not realised you had never seen it,' said John. "'But I suppose you were not grown up in those days, and since you grew up I have been abroad.' "'Shall you go abroad again?' "'No, I have given up my secretaryship. I have come back to England for good.' "'I am glad of that. I have been away too long as it is.' "'Yes,' said I. "'I have often thought so.' "'Why?' There was a pause. "'We are not represented,' said Di proudly. She was speaking to one of her own family, and consequently she was not careful to choose her words. She had evidently no fear of being misunderstood by John. "'We have always taken a place,' she went on, "'not a particularly high one, but one of some kind. There was Amius Tempest, the Cavalier General, and John, who was with Charles of Bourbon at the sacking of Rome, and there were judges and admirals. Not that that is much when one looks at other families, the Cecils, for instance, but still they were always among the men of the day. And then our great-grandfather, who lies in Westminster Abbey, really was a great man.' I was reading his life over again the other day. I suppose his son only passed muster because he was his son, and owing to his wife's ability. She amused old George the Fourth and made herself a pa, and pushed her husband. "'My father never did anything,' said John. "'No. I have always heard he has brains, but that he let things go because he was unhappy. Just the reason for holding on to them all the tighter, I should have thought, wouldn't you?' "'Not with some people. Some people can't do anything if there is no one to be glad when they have done it. I partly understand the feeling.' "'I don't,' said I. "'I mean, I do, but I do understand giving in to it, and letting a little bit of personal unhappiness, which will die with one, prevent one's being a good, useful link in a chain. 
"'One owes that to the chain.' "'Yes,' said John. "'And yet I know he had a very strong feeling of responsibility "'from what he said to me on his deathbed. "'I have often thought about him since, "'and tried to piece together all the little fragments I can remember of him. "'But I think there is no one I can understand less than my own father. "'He seemed a hard, cold man, "'and yet that face is neither hard nor cold.' "'John pointed to a picture behind her, "'and Di rose and turned to look at it. It was an interesting, refined face, destitute of any kind of good looks, except those of high breeding. The eyes had a certain thoughtful challenge in them. The lips were thin and firm. Both gazed in silence for a moment. He looked as if he might have been one of those quiet, equable people who may be pushed into a corner, said I, and then become rather dangerous. I can imagine his being a harsh man, and an unforgiving one if life went wrong. "'I'm afraid he did become that,' said John. "'As he could not find room for forgiveness, there was naturally no room for happiness either.' "'Was there someone whom he could not forgive?' asked I, turning her keen glance upon him. She evidently knew nothing of the feud of the last generation. At this moment the rush of James the Elephant-Footed was heard, and he announced that Mrs. Courtney was getting into the carriage and had sent for Miss Tempest. "'Good-bye,' said Di cordially, gathering up her gloves and parasol. "'Go to Overly and get strong, and—you will have so many other things to think of. Try not to forget about asking us.' "'I will remember,' said John, as if he would make a point of burdening his memory. He was holding aside the curtain for her to pass. "'You see,' said Di, looking back, when we are on the move we can do things, but once we get back to London we cannot go north again till next year. We can't afford it. I will be sure to remember, said John again. He was a little crestfallen and yet relieved that she should think he might forget. He felt that he could trust his memory. She smiled gratefully and was gone. She had forgotten to shake hands with him. He knew she had not been aware of the omission. She had been thinking of something else at the moment but it remained a grievous fact all the same. He walked back absently into the drawing-room and stopped opposite the tea-table. "'Vinegar,' he said to himself, "'what can James have been about? I draw the line at vinegar at five o'clock. I hope she didn't see it.' He took out the glass stopper. "'Not vinegar, no. There is but one name for that familiar, that searching smell.' "'It's brandy,' said John aloud, speaking to himself while the past unrolled itself like a map before his eyes. "'Yes, look at it. Would you like to spill it again? There's no need to be so surprised. You had some of it not ten minutes ago, you poor, deluded, blinded, banshed idiot.' "'Whom do you think I have seen?' said Di, as they drove away. Mrs. Courtney had made no attempt to guess, which was the more remarkable, because, when Miss Fane had ordered a cup of tea for Di, James had volunteered the information— that he had already taken tea to Mr. and Miss Tempest. "'Whom but John himself?' continued Di. "'I thought he was still invisible.' "'I'm sure he ought to be. I never saw anyone look so ill. We had tea together. I really thought you were never going away at all. But I was glad you were such a long time, because it was so pleasant seeing him again. I like John, don't you? I have liked him from the first. He is a sensible man, but I prefer people with easier manners myself. He is more than sensible, I think. We shall be too late for the pony races, said Mrs. Courtney. It is nearly six now, and I told Lord Hemsworth we would be at the entrance at half past five. He will survive it, said Di, archly. And, Granny, John is going to ask us to Overly. I told him I had never seen it. Good gracious, exclaimed Mrs. Courtney. There was no doubt about her interest this time. You did not suggest our going, did you? I'm not sure I did not, said Di, unfurling her parasol. Look, Granny, there is Mrs. Buller nodding to you, and you won't look at her. Uh, yes, I rather think I did. I, I can't remember exactly what I said, but he promised he would not forget, and I told him we could only come when we were on the move. I impressed that upon him. Really, Di, said Mrs. Courtney with asperity. I wish you would prevent your parasol catching in my bonnet and not offer visits without consulting me. 
it would have been quite time enough to have gone when he had asked us. He might not have asked us. Mrs. Courtney, who had seen a good deal of John in the weeks that preceded his accident, was perhaps of a different opinion, but she did not express it. Neither did she mention her own previously fixed intention of going to Overley somehow or other during the course of her summer visits. "'What is the use of near relations,' continued Di, "'if you can't tell them anything of that kind? I believe John will be quite pleased to have us now that he knows we wish to come. If only he remembers. Come, Granny, if I take you to Arkelo to please you, you ought to take me to Overley to please me. That's fair now, isn't it?' "'It may be extremely inconvenient.' said Mrs. Courtney, still ruffled. And I had rheumatism last time I was there. Think what rheumatism you always have at Arkelow, which sits up to its knees in mist every night in the middle of its moat. And yet you would insist on going again. There's that nice Mr. Sinclair taking off his hat. Won't you recognise him? You thought him so improved, you said, since his elder brother's death. My dear, said Mrs. Courtney, I am not so perpetually on the lookout for young men as you appear to be. All the same, you may put up my parasol, for I can see nothing but the sun in my eyes. End of Volume 2, Chapter 2